Thank you all for coming. I'm super excited to be here. And uh, I'm really excited about MesosCon because I love distributed systems. And distributed systems, as we all know, are, are fairly challenging because actually reasoning about what happens in our, in our applications and our infrastructure can be a real pain in the neck sometimes. So you know, if we wanted to build a service, say, running on top of Mesos, let's say we want to build a service for managing MesosCon, we're going to have a bunch of different sort of application servers running at any given time, right? We might have a set of servers for managing attendee login. And in order to provide sort of good capacity and also fault tolerance, we probably replicate this service. We might also have a couple other services, one for performing room reservations, maybe something for social media monitoring. I hear a few of you are probably on Twitter right now. Uh, and we probably have a database sitting here as well. And the complexity comes in the scenario when we consider the fact that all of these different services are performing their operations potentially concurrently while simultaneously making requests to one another. And this complexity, even this very simple application, becomes very hard to reason about, right? So for instance, if you and I are attached to different instances of the room reservation service, should you and I be able to simultaneously reserve rooms? Certainly we don't want to book the keynote at the same time, right? But if we reserve different rooms, this, might, this may or may not be okay. Similarly, right, if, I, if you're in the room reservation service, I'm the login service, right, should those operations proceed concurrently? Or if, or if, for instance, you're on a completely different service like Twitter, what happens if I change my username? What, what happens to the data that we're, that we're potentially manipulating concurrently uh, when we don't have sort of a global view of state? Now, you know, the classic solution to this problem is essentially to punt on the problem, right? So the, the classic strategy we, 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 we use to deal with concurrency is to simply hide it from the application programmer, right? So we can take all of the servers we have deployed, say on Mesos and multiple different data centers, and simply provide users with a beautiful abstraction, essentially the illusion that there's really only one copy of state. So this abstraction of essentially serial access. I perform my operations on state, you perform your operations on state. We don't think about concurrent operation at all. We sort of hide distribution. And there are a couple ways that we can kind of get this abstraction, right? So there are many mechanisms for enforcing this. For instance, the use of acid transactions that we all know and love and maybe hate. Um, we can use algorithms like consensus protocols as found in systems like Zookeeper or etcd today to essentially provide a totally ordered log of operations where, again, the order of the log dictates the order of events that should occur in the system. And this is a really, really nice way to program. Right? I mean, parallel programming is hard. Let's just, let's just remove concurrency from the equation. Well, it would be nice if I could end the talk, you know, two minutes and 30 seconds in, and we could just kind of sit back and talk about how great our lives are. But unfortunately, right, coordination is fairly expensive, right? So if you and I are coordinating, if our, if our processes have to coordinate, then, then we really can't make progress independently, right? If we have to decide if you should go first or I should go first, well, one or both of us are going to have to wait. And this leads to some serious limitations, some fairly fundamental limitations on operational behavior in the systems that we build. Now, we all probably know that coordination is expensive. These are fairly straightforward limitations, but I want to walk through them fairly quickly in order to really hammer home this point that coordination is a real problem in systems today. First of all, coordination limits scalability, right? So if we have multiple instances of a service and we want to serve traffic from each, well, if these two instances of our services need to communicate, well, we can certainly serve traffic from the instance on the right, but unfortunately, it's going to have to stall and essentially go and communicate with the instance on the left. This is okay, but just if we're trying to add capacity by adding more processes, well, we're going to end up bottlenecking on this sort of point of, of, of rendezvous, right? There's going to be a really fundamental limitation on how, how much capacity we can get by throwing more resources at a problem. This is also going to affect throughput in the sense that as we actually perform the process of negotiating who should go first in this system, it's going to be potentially fairly slow. And then an example of, of how slow this can be, I'll show you results from a simple micro benchmark on Amazon. So this is running distributed transactions over a set of eight servers. These are fairly beefy instances. We're just running kind of in-memory locking for these transactions. On the x-axis, I have the number of servers that we're touching in every given operation. And on the y-axis, we have throughput in terms of transactions per second. What we see is when we take this coordinate approach of locking, right? When I want to grab an item or touch a server, I grab a lock on that server. We see that on a single node, we can get around a million operations per second, which is, which is reasonable, right? It's a pretty good uh, throughput. But as we, for instance, move from one server to two servers, such that when I go to server A and request the lock, you might already have that lock, and you're waiting for an RPC on server B, suddenly we see a precipitous decrease in throughput. So really, almost 400x decrease in throughput simply by the fact that you're holding locks when you're waiting on a network is a recipe for a bad time. Let's talk about latency, right? So throughput is essentially a problem because we have multiple requests queuing up after one another. 
even in the situation where we're the only user in the system, if we have to coordinate between our processes, this exchange of messages is going to be potentially expensive, right? As Neha talked about in her keynote yesterday, tail latencies can really add up. And sort of the limit, right, our servers live on planet Earth. As we continue to scale our servers out to more and more data centers, for instance, we're going to be fundamentally limited by the speed of light in terms of how quickly we can communicate. For instance, if we send a message around the equator, unless if we invent some way of communicating via quantum entanglement and avoid the speed of light, we, we can essentially only go around the globe around seven and a half times per second, which is not very good. If we get a little bit more creative, you know, high frequency traders are blowing up mountains in Pennsylvania to lower latencies. We might as well send some nukes through the center of the earth. If we drill through the circumference of the earth, we'll get around 85 milliseconds, which is still not good enough in all of the cases. Finally, and ultimately, there's this problem of availability. So if we have two servers and they can't communicate, but they need to coordinate, for instance, this guy on the right can't talk to the guy on the left, then we're gonna have to deny some of these operations, essentially the ability to proceed. Why does all this matter? Well, we start off with this very nice abstraction, this serial access to shared state. And we said this is the way we'd like to program our systems. And in fact, a good way, it's a good starting point for our systems. But unfortunately, right, there's this very high cost associated with it, right? There's this fundamental penalty, which is when we're coordinating all of the time, we're not gonna be able to achieve very good scalability. We're gonna have throughput and latency penalties. And in certain cases, we won't be able to give users a response at all. And this is sort of a sad state of affairs. It's a bit of an existential quandary. You know, are, we, are, we, are we destined to you know, lead the rest of our lives wandering the earth, simply coordinating all of the time and running so slowly? I mean, you ask yourself, so surely there's a better way to build distributed systems than this. Well, perhaps surprisingly, the answer comes not from the distributed systems community, but actually comes from one of the greats of American cinematography, Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> so, in Quentin Tarantino's 1994 classic, Pulp Fiction, there's a scene in which Uma Thurman and John Travolta are essentially sharing what you might call an uncomfortable silence. They don't know each other. It's a protracted sort of delay in their, in their communication. And at the end of this uncomfortable silence, Uma Thurman's character drops just a profound nugget of wisdom that we can all learn from. She asks John Travolta, why do we feel it's necessary to yak in order to feel comfortable? You know, that's when you know you found somebody really special. When you can just shut up for a minute and comfortably share silence. Now this is a nice statement about sort of maybe the human condition, our relationship to one another, you know, how can we be better people in the world, but, but for the purpose of this talk, given the time constraints, we're just gonna focus on what this means about scalable distributed systems. I'm going to assert that scalable systems can shut up and comfortably share silence. If you remember one thing from this talk, this is the most important takeaway. If you wanna build scalable systems, ensure that your processes can make progress without communication. In this talk, I want to unpack this message by answering two specific questions. First of all, why is shutting up truly the key to building scalable systems? And second of all, what does it mean to comfortably share silence? That is, can we always achieve sort of non-coordinated or coordination-free execution? And when do we have to pay the price of, say, uh, coordination in terms of scalability or latency impacts? So to get started, why is shutting up good for systems? Why is, why is Quentin Tarantino's observation so profound? Well, in a sense, coordination-free systems essentially aren't up against all of these strict limits of their coordinated counterparts. For instance, if we have two separate servers and they can independently service requests, they're not gonna be up against, say, latency, scalability, throughput limitations as we saw earlier. Recall previously, right, when we tried to scale our system out, we would have a point of coordination that might become a scalability bottleneck. In contrast, our coordination-free systems can effectively enable indefinite linear scale-out. We can add more resources to our clusters and make use of them without actually affecting the existing nodes in the system. Essentially, you give me more resources, I can make use of them. Each process can effectively serve and uh, service requests without having to coordinate or contact any of the existing servers. This is, this is really the gold standard for scalability. Let's come back to our question of throughput. So we saw this precipitous decrease in throughput as you move from one server to two servers, holding locks over the network, not a good, not a good time. If we don't hold locks, if we opt for a coordination-free strategy for this micro benchmark, we see we don't have the similar throughput penalty. So on a single node, there's not an order of magnitude performance improvement. 
And this is because in our coordinated implementation, all of our requests are queuing up on one core on this multi-core server. In contrast, our coordination-free approach can use all of the 32 contexts on this EC2 instance simultaneously. As we move out to multi-server transactions, as, we, as, as you know, we're coordinating over up to seven servers at once, well, in the coordination-free case, we're just running requests in parallel. And so we see up to three order of magnitude performance improvement. That's pretty good. Coming back to latency, well, you know, if you're in Zimbabwe and I'm in Seattle, well, we can each service requests from our, from our local replicas. We don't have to pay that price of, of communication. So that's also pretty good. And, and finally, right, we have this problem of availability. Well, recall that when we had to coordinate, we couldn't communicate, we had a bad time. In this case, you know, if we're coordination free, any replica can respond to any requests. So I have, you know, two servers or two processes in my system. I can serve requests from each of them with low latency. Um, if there's a network partition between these servers, who cares? The system, the system continues to behave as normal. Similarly, you know, one of my servers can go up and, and burn a fiery death, and um, as long as our process, as long as our request can get to at least one live process, we're essentially done. Now, notably, right, when we, when we talk about sort of coordination, when we think about coordination, we often really fixate only on the failure case, right? So those of you who've heard of the CAP theorem, right, will know that there's a lot of confusion. We say, well, gosh, network partitions don't happen in my data center, apparently. Um, so I don't care about, you know, CAP or, or the cost of coordination. But the punchline here, and why I make such a big deal out of all four of these, is that there are tangible benefits for the non-failure uh, you know, case as well, right? So we can improve throughput by focusing on this sort of worst case behavior. At a very high level, the punchline here is simple. Why is shutting up good? Well, maintaining silence, or comfortably maintaining silence, is key to actually scaling out our systems. Scalability is a pretty badly abused word, but I would claim this cuts to the essence of the problem. Adding more servers, actually works if you're in a coordination-free system. Now, this all sounds pretty good, right? I mean, I, I know I want coordination-free systems design. The question is, you know, when can I actually meaningful, meaningfully achieve it? When can our systems comfortably share this silence? And when do we, for instance, have to give up all of these nice benefits we just talked about? Well, you we think back to our earlier example, right, and all of these questions we were asking, you know, should you and I be able to simultaneously reserve rooms? Well, it seems like if we just let everything run concurrently, we might end up in, in weird situations, right? We might double book a given room, or for instance, you might tweet something that doesn't correspond to my current username. So we need to think hard now, right? If we've given up this illusion of serial access to state, we need to think about, well, what exactly do we have to ensure about the operation for performing in a concurrent manner? Right? When can we, in fact, safely share silence? And under what scenarios do we need to coordinate? At a very high level, the, the key to avoiding coordination is fairly simple. If operations are proceeding concurrently on separate processes, you're over in Zimbabwe, I'm in Seattle, we're performing our operations, we're not waiting for another, we're just rushing ahead, getting all these nice properties, high throughput and so on, then we had better be sure that once you and I learn of what each other did, then the side effects of what we've performed can effectively be composed in a way that makes sense. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by composition in a way that makes sense? Well, let's unpack both of these elements. By composed, I really mean that when you have a side effect from your server, from your operations, and I have a side effect from my operations, we need some way to be able to combine these into a common state, right? So if you write one over on your server, and I write the value one over on my server, we need to say, well, gosh, what does it mean to take the effects of these two operations together? Can we, for instance, one of the terminology that we use you know, commonly, you may have heard of this, is the notion of merging the effects of operations. So can we merge these operations in a way that makes sense? For instance, in some cases, you might say, well, we each wrote one, so the value of the item is one. For other applications, you might say, well, gosh, what we were really doing was building a distributed counter. So when you write one and I write one, we get two. Okay? So we need a way to combine these things or merge them. Similarly, right, if, if I write A and you write B, you might want to say store both of those effects. So this idea of composability essentially ensures that at the end of the day, despite concurrent execution, even divergent execution, on different copies of state, we can actually agree after the fact, after we've performed our operations, on what the end state of the system should be. Now, by itself, 
composing operations is pretty easy, right? If all we wanted to make sure is that we could agree on some value, you know, you and I could say, you know, whatever you write, whatever I write, we'll just throw it out. Let's just return the value 42 to every request, right? That would be a way to guarantee that, yeah, our results can be composed. The problem is it's not really useful to do so. And that's, that's what the second point really gets at. What does it mean for composition to make sense? Well, one way we, which we can sort of capture is a specification of correctness, um, sort of what we would like to have happen is to talk about invariance over distributed state. For instance, we might say, well, gosh, those counters you were incrementing, as long as they remain positive, that's fine. Or building a bank account, for instance, we might say, yeah, make sure account balances aren't negative. We might have other constraints, like make sure no one writes a null value to the database. No one likes tweeting at the, at the null Twitter handle. Someone probably has that handle, by the way. Um, let's make sure, for instance, usernames are unique, or, or you know, in our, in our scheduling application, right, no two talks share a given time slot. Okay? So we, we need to basically think about what types of invariance about our distributed state we care about having whole. And once we have these two sort of criteria, the way we want to merge our operations, and in and, and, and a, and a set of specifications, essentially invariance over the state we want to have hold, we essentially need to reason, well, is it in fact the case that concurrent execution will preserve our invariance? I mean, the high level idea is fairly simple, composing invariance in a way that makes sense. To go a little bit deeper, what we're essentially asking here is, can invariance be violated by merging independent operations, okay? Now, there's a big fancy name for, for this property. For, if you're sort of a distributed systems nerd like me, you can read the paper and understand what invariant confluence means. Uh, but but, but just, let's just use a simple acronym, ICT, that says, can invariance be, be violated by merging these independent operations? And, and I want to illustrate this, instead of sort of throwing up some formulas on the slides, I'm just go through a few simple examples. So imagine you have an invariant that user IDs should be positive, so non-negative. And you want to add users to a given database. And our merge operation, when you add a user on one copy of this database and I add a user on another copy of the database, we just, we just simply kind of put them both into the database, okay? So it's a very sensible pr procedure. And we want to say, well, does this ICT actually hold for this combination of invariance operations and merge functions? Well, let's go through an example, right? If we have an empty database state and I add Stu with ID1 on one copy of state and you add Ann also with ID1 on the other copy of database state, when we apply our merge function to these two side effects of the operations, then in fact we end up in a, oop, too exciting, man. So we end up in a situation where our invariant actually holds. Right? And in fact I would claim that it's going to be very hard under this particular set of invariance operation merges to come up with an execution under which this ICT does not pass. I'll actually assert that ICT holds for this given uh, execution. But notably, right, if we change our invariance and operations, we might get a different result here. For instance, if we require that user IDs are not just non-negative, but we require, for instance, instead that they're unique, right, globally unique, well, we might get a different answer. So if we run that exact same execution, where I add Stu and you add Ann, we each choose ID 1. On their own, these are unique sets of IDs. When we combine them, suddenly we violated our invariant. So for this given set of invariance operation merges, our ICT essentially fails. If we changed our merge function, for instance, to reassign any duplicate IDs, so when we merged, Stu got bumped from ID1 to ID2, we could pass the ICT. But for the way in which we specified our program, we have to coordinate, essentially. The reason why this ICT actually matters, as I hinted at earlier, is that if ICT passes, it means we don't have to coordinate. We can find a way to implement our, our, our application and our algorithms in a way where we don't have to pay the price of coordination. Right? We can truly, comfortably share silence. If we can show that ICT fails, that is, there's some trace where our system execution might end up violating an invariant, then we need coordination. This is the necessary and sufficient condition for coordination-free execution. Popping up a level of abstraction, right? You guys already knew this, right? We just said operations must be composed in a way that, that makes sense. Right? If you can apply that to your applications, you're, you're good to go. And in sense, this ICT is simply formalizing in a, in, a, in a bit more formal context in terms of, you know, using some of the theory of distributed systems to essentially say, yes, this is what we mean by composition. Coming back to our applications, when can we comfortably share silence here? Well, we can apply this type of thinking about comp making sense despite composition to our set of questions. For instance, can you and I simultaneously reserve rooms? Well, if we simultaneously book the same room, probably not. If we know up front that you're not going to book the ballroom and I'm only going to book one of the other rooms, 
then we're okay. Similarly, right, if we had a merge function that, for instance, in the case that Ben reserves the, the keynote room and I reserve the keynote room, well, Ben's a pretty special guy. We'll give him the keynote room and we'll reassign me to the, to the you know, utility closet. Then, you know, that would also work. So it's really the question here, when can we comfortably share silence, is essentially asking, when can our operations be safely composed, okay? And you ask, well, gosh, you know, how many operations in practice actually pass this test, right? Are we doomed to coordinate all of the time, or are there actually instances where we can safely avoid coordination? When does this ICT stuff actually matter in practice? Well, in the course of our research, we've looked at a couple different applications. We've looked at a bunch of constraints as found in databases today uh, as an SQL. We found that many of these constraints can actually be implemented in a way that doesn't use coordination. We already went through a few of these. For instance, uh, this is not the complete list, but for instance, if we want to have equality or inequality constraints, as we saw with our non-negative ID case, we can in fact um, achieve that without coordination while specifying a unique ID is not good enough. Now, everyone knows that SQL doesn't actually scale. So let's talk about a more scalable platform. Let's talk about Ruby on Rails. So we went online to uh, github.com and downloaded 67 of the most popular Ruby on, Ruby on Rails code uh, programs. I'd love to actually, if, if you run Rails, I'd love to actually take a look at your applications as well. But what we found from these 67 most popular Rails projects is that their constraints, which were fairly common, so we looked at 10,000 of these things, 87% of them actually passed this ICT. What this means is that always coordinating in order to enforce the Rails constraints as Rails does today is fairly inefficient. Specifically, right, we can use something like acid transaction to coordinate 100% of the time. What the ICT tells us is that we only need to coordinate for a little over 13% of the time. This is a big gap between the way in which our systems are built today and how efficient we can make them while still preserving the application criteria that we care about those invariants, operations, and merges, as found in the wild. Now, there's an interesting question here, right? We said we can avoid coordination. The question is, how do we actually do it? And it's kind of a tricky problem here in that if we look to the way in which we implement coordinated uh, operations today, we're often paying too much, right? I said Rails over coordinates. It turns out that in many cases where we can find a coordination-free implementation where ICT passes, the way in which we've been doing it for years is actually a little bit broken. And to give a very simple example, there's a guarantee from relational databases today, almost every database provides this, called read committed. And the basic property is very simple. It says, when you make multiple updates to an item, make sure that people only see your final update. So, you know, for instance, if I assign my username's Peter, and then I change my mind later, and, and I say my name's P. Bayless, and then I commit, that's okay. But no one should come along and read that intermediate state that my name was Peter. This is like kind of a least common denominator across the way, across, you know, database uh, implementations today. Now, the way in which this is implemented, right, this, this guarantee was invented in the 1970s. It's often implemented actually in the same way it was in the 1970s on a single node database. And that is, it's, it's implemented using locking. So I have some record name here. Uh, I want to update my record, run this top transaction. Well, I'll grab a lock on the name record. I'll make my update. Oh, I put name Peter down, I changed my mind, I'm gonna update this and instead store P. Bayless, right? And once I'm done with all of my operations, I release my locks, and life is good. Now the problem with this implementation, right, is that we're, we're essentially using locks as a point of coordination. While I hold the lock on the data item, you have to wait, and we end up with all of these terrible problems we saw with coordination earlier. The question is, is this coordination strictly necessary to enforce this idea that we don't see intermediate data? Well, we can apply the same kind of ICT reasoning. It turns out that read committed passes the ICT, as we saw earlier. The question is, how do we actually go about finding an implementation? Well, I'll present one very simple implementation strategy. It'd be interesting to see if you can come up with, with others that also work. But, but in one implementation, instead of simply locking our records during axes, we could use something like multi-versioning instead. So we have our name record here. Instead of overriding the data, we could simply write, name is Peter, name is P. Bayless. Once we complete our transaction, we decide, okay, P. Bayless is the data that is actually okay to read. It's actually the final data that I'm gonna write in this transaction. I'll tag it as okay. What this allows me to do is any other reader who comes along while I'm running my transaction and wants to read the value of the record can essentially read anything tagged as okay and it'll be fine. Similarly, multiple writers can, can run over the database at the same time, and they won't interfere with one another. Pretty simple example, 
but are perhaps surprising that you know, we're essentially saddled with these legacy implementations from the 1970s, which work really well on a single node, but unfortunately don't really scale out and are a kind of bad, bad strategy in this distributed environment. Let's go through a little bit more complex uh, example. So it turns out there's a, there's a similar, slightly different property that's very important in many distributed systems. So you want to see all of the updates or see none of the updates of a transaction. So let's say I post on a social media, you know, I'm talking at MesosCon, and I'm in Seattle. I might want to make sure that, for instance, my friends know that I'm in Seattle, I'm at MesosCon, they don't think that I'm just in Seattle and I don't want to hang out, right? I'm talking to all of you instead. Turns out this guarantee is actually fairly common. It's used in a bunch of use cases like indexing, materialized views, foreign key constraints, if you're familiar with any of those. But just for now, consider the very simple problem. You want to make sure that if you see that I'm talking, you see that I'm in Seattle. Classic implementation here. Scratch your head a little bit. What, what, we, what have we been using all along? What do databases still use today? Oh, they lock all of the records where they perform the updates. This is, this is correct, right? Coordination is a means towards achieving sort of correct behavior. The question is, is it strictly necessary? And unfortunately, the result today is that, you know, many scalable implementations of these sorts of mechanisms, like indexing and materialized views, essentially are in implemented in a way that surfaces incorrect data um, at per in production today. The question for us is, can we get this property without coordination? Well, we can apply the ICT reasoning. Perhaps surprisingly, this desired property actually passes ICT, so we should be able to find an implementation. The question is, what's the implementation look like? Well, what if we do something you know, using multi-versioning again? Multi-version turns out to be a fairly, fairly useful technique. Um, and we have these protocols called ramp transactions. I'll just give you the flavor of what we do here. So we've got our two records we want to update, the status record and the location record. And we want to post one update to each. So what we do is we perform our updates to each record. Instead of simply writing the value along with each item, we attach some special metadata. So for instance, along with the talking record, we say, okay, this has a special version, which is a unique version that we call you know, timestamp 10. And we say, oh, this talking update, also there's a corresponding update in the location record. In the location record, we have this update Seattle, has the same timestamp, and also has essentially a pointer back to the status record. Once we've put our updates on both of the servers, we can now mark them as okay to read. Such that if you observe, for instance, that I've tagged talking as ready to read, but you haven't observed that I've tagged Seattle as ready to read, I've essentially stored a pointer for you. And you can go back and fetch that missing version if in fact you observe, yeah, I'm talking, but you didn't see that update to Seattle because I hadn't actually completed it at the time. Not a super crazy technique, but it's really powerful in terms of implementing many of these guarantees that we care about. I mean, the key, the key idea here is we can prevent reader stalls by essentially telling the database, pushing some of this information about what we're trying to do into the actual concurrency control protocol. There's actually a couple different ways in which, if you're interested, we can compact this metadata down to even a constant if we're interested. Ultimately, does any of this matter? Well, I made some claims about sort of scalability of micro benchmarks and so on. It turns out that when we implement these, these algorithms and these applications, right, real applications, in a way that maximizes the potential for coordination avoidance, we actually see similar speed ups. So as one example, there's this benchmark in the database community, it's called the gold standard for concurrency control systems, right? This is what all the vendors, all the researchers essentially compete on called TPCC. And TPCC has 16 invariants that have to be upheld during execution. Notably, 14 out of 16 of these invariants pass the ICT which means that when we do a head-to-head -head comparison between state-of-the-art concurrency control algorithms in, for serializability and state-of-the-art concurrency control algorithms like RAMP and the ones I showed you for read committed and a few other bells and whistles, on the exact same hardware, we can achieve order of magnitude performance speed up. Similarly, right, we can scale this thing out like MAD in the sense that we aren't coordinating, there's no centralized uh, point of coordination, and so we get you know, 25x improvement over the best listed result here. What's happening here is I'm not a great hacker. I'm simply thinking, what coordination is strictly required to enforce the invariants that have been defined by the community for this workload? And it turns out that, in fact, if we only coordinate for those two out of 16 that don't pass the ICT, we get a huge speed up, right? And we can continue to scale essentially indefinitely if only we put our thinking caps on and ask, when is coordination strictly required? Now, there are a few key design patterns and ways of thinking about coordination avoidance beyond the simple idea of sort of thinking about when we can safely compose operations. The first of which is that you don't have to come up with your own merge operations necessarily. That counter I mentioned, it turned out there are libraries. Neil Conway's work on BlueML, work on what you might have heard of called CRDTs, can automatically merge operations on our behalf. 
for things like counters, sets, lists, and so on. Turns out that multi-version can prevent stalls during concurrent execution, as we saw in our read committed and our ramp algorithm, right? These are very, very powerful techniques. You don't want to update in place if other readers might come in and have to actually read the data that you wrote, but you weren't ready to show yet. And finally, right, when you do have to coordinate, distribute as little as possible. Just because a part of your application has to coordinate, and likely it will, right? Very few applications are entirely coordination free. Doesn't mean you have to freak out and simply go back to Zookeeper. Instead, what you need to do is you say, well, how can I minimize the, location, the, the duration and the location of this coordination so that ideally I'm performing a very small critical section on one server maximum? Ultimately, and more philosophically, coordination avoidance, fully realizing this potential, requires rethinking the API here. Read, write transactions, distributed logs, consensus objects are all really too low level to allow our systems to do their job the best that they can. In fact, it's a little bit cruel that we ask our systems to scale when essentially we give them so little applica application knowledge about what we're trying to do. You know, as Gary Larson points out, it's not very nice when you yell at your dog for getting in the garbage. You know, the dog just hears blah, 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 blah. It might hear its name. It knows you're mad at it. It knows it did something wrong. But the question is, what did it do wrong? And perhaps surprising, right, we ask our systems to scale, and yet we're telling them all, all of this nice stuff, and they're only hearing, you know, wah, 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 read, write, read, write, read, write. They don't have the semantic information required in order to make these types of application decisions on their own. So I urge you, if you really want to maximize the operational potential of your application, push this down into your system and find APIs in which your application programs can express their constraints, express what it means for their merge functions to make sense, so that you can actually realize the potential. Otherwise, they'll be stuck back in essentially 1976 with Jim Gray and the transaction processing crowd. Now, this is the result of a bunch of different work that I've done with a number of colleagues at Berkeley. And we've been surprised sort of time and time again in how essentially across many different domains, so these open source applications I've looked at, uh, common analytics tasks, index maintenance, graph maintenance, transaction isolation, time and time again, there is latent potential for coordination-free execution if only we open our eyes to it. At a very high level, there are only two takeaways from this talk. The first is that scalable systems can comfortably share silence. Stop yakking and comfortably share the silence. To actually achieve this in practice, you need to think about which of your operations can be composed in a way that makes sense. And given those operations that can be composed, really exploit that in your system design. This is joint work with a bunch of folks at Berkeley and also the University of Sydney, without whom I couldn't have, couldn't have done this work. And with that, I'd be happy to either share an uncomfortable silence or take questions. Thanks for your time. Yeah, so how do you decide whether an operation passes IC without having implementation in the first place? So it, it's, it's pretty much as simple as essentially looking at the operation you're trying to perform, looking at the ways in which when you perform an operation on one server and I perform an operation on another server, you want to combine these things. So you need to reason about how essentially you merge the, the effects of a concurrent operation, which you know, essentially every distributed system has to do anyway. Right? You receive a message that says, hey, you updated some tuple. Do I want to just blow away my previous state or do I want to apply it? Right? So that's what kind of CRDTs get at. Um, and then I just say, well, and you, you essentially reason, is there a way in which, given two you know, sort of valid copies of state that are divergent, I can merge them in a way that gives me an uh, invalid state or violates my invariance? And that's the simplest way to apply this stuff in practice today. Just say, can I compose these things in a way that makes sense and reason out what your application looks like? Now, if you're in research like me, there's actually some cool program analysis techniques that you can apply to this. In fact, we're interested in, in actually automating more of that, say, that Ruby on Rails program analysis. But for today, it's really just a simple message, reason about composition in a way that makes sense. Good, great question. So you said, yeah, I, did, I, talked, I, I beat up on locking pretty hard in this talk, right? So what about, what about all of the bazillion other concurrence control protocols that implement serializability? Um, this is a good, good question. So it turns out that any implementation of serializability is going to require coordination. 
Right? So you use optimistic methods, multiverting concurrent control, whatever. The point is that the semantics you're trying to enforce fundamentally require coordination. Right? You can, you can, you know, it's been known since the, since the 80s. You can prove that however you implement a replicated system, serializable, will require some form of coordination. Now, exactly how expensive that coordination is, how it's implemented, and so on, is going to depend on the choice of protocol, right? So, you know, in optimistic concurrency control, we don't coordinate at the start of each operation. We coordinate at the end of all of the operations. But fundamentally, right, these scalability and latency limitations persist independent of how we implement these things. If there's a chance that your concurrent operation can corrupt what I'm trying to do over here, which is the case with these strong models like serializability, then we had better coordinate. Uh, I'm getting a pointer. Someone over here? Is that, oh, yeah. So just so, I, just so I heard you right, do I see this as a thing for compilers or for distributed systems and uh, application engineers? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So basically, is this like a, you know, do we just cross our fingers and hope for language to take care of this for us? Do we do, we do some you know, legwork ourselves? So there's a lot of interesting work and research on building, uh, as I alluded to, sort of, formal methods and, and verification techniques to actually automatically prove properties like the IC that they talked about here. And I think that's great research that should be continuing, you know, should, should be done in, uh, you know, in the research community, industrial research labs, and so on. And I think there's a chance that one day that makes it out to prime time. However, I'm mostly concerned with, with production systems today. And so, for me, the real win here comes in saying, okay, let's look at actual applications we see today. And yeah, it's gonna require a little pen and paper work to think about, you know, or, or just hard thinking, right? When, in fact, are things composable or not? But I think you can apply these techniques or this sort of, these sorts of design principles today in applications uh, that we see commonly. Now, now in, in our research, the way that we've done this is we've said, well, what are the common constraints that we find uh, in database, in database backup applications today, right? So if, for instance, we can make foreign key constraint maintenance faster, whenever I see a foreign key constraint in my schema, I can now plug in ramp transactions instead of just relying on some heavily coordinated implementation. And that essentially enables, in my opinion, sort of more modular reuse of some of these techniques rather than simply having it on an application by application basis. Realistically, running in production today, a good starting point is to start with coordination. When things get too slow or you need greater availability, then you pull in the big guns, you start applying these types of techniques, and for the instances that are extremely high value, high throughput, high availability, then you start applying this type of uh, design thinking. Oh, and there's another question. Can, 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 can you, uh, like, yell maybe? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So what about, basically, what about, you know, multi-core cache coherency and so on? So a lot of these techniques can be applied in this domain. For instance, uh, some of Neha, the keynote speaker yesterday, some of her work was really interesting and said, well, if operations are commutative or can be executed in parallel, you can have different phases of program execution where we can, for instance, execute the, the, the essentially ICT-style operations uh, on, on multiple, thre multiple threads, multiple cores in parallel, and then merge them at the, end of, at the end of each sort of split phase. And this is work called Doppel, which is very nice. The real challenge for sort of arbitrary parallel programming in a, on, a, on an SMP, you know, multiprocessor, is that the cache coherency protocol doesn't allow me to do merge automatically, right? So when, when I write to a register, and you write to a register, say the same memory location, there's some chip, or you know, there's, there's some circuitry baked into the hardware that essentially says, okay, you know, one of our writes is going to win. There's no way, for instance, to automatically, in the hardware that I'm aware of, I'd love to see it, essentially allow it so that when you write one to memory address dead beef, and I write one to memory address dead beef, we somehow get two, we instead get one. And so in a sense, the, the Concepts can be applied in software, but the way in which the hardware implements these things, there's not such a natural point in which we can inject merge, merge functions and, and sort of detect uh, automatically uh, points in which we can exploit the potential for coordination avoiding execution. Now, merge is done by the hardware, frequently. Yeah. <laughs> 
great. It's merge the new question to solve, or you know, a new problem to solve. It's a good question. So in a sense, we have good implementations of merge for a lot of data types that you care about, right? So um, you know, the counter, sets, lists, and so on. And there's been a lot of work on this. For instance, React, I think Basho is here as a sponsor. React ships with automatic merge functions out of the box. They use this theory of CRDTs. And so the real challenge, I think, is understanding your application demands and saying, what merge makes sense for you? Right? And I think, actually, I would claim in practice one of the harder things, given that we have this library of, of data types, is instead reasoning out the invariance that our program should, should uphold. Um, but it's all sort of the same thing, right? There's a sort of careful interplay between the operations you want to perform, how you want to merge them, and what invariants you care about. And if you screw up any one of them, like you say, oh, I'm just going to drop all of the rights on the floor, well, you can end up with a system that looks safe, but isn't very useful. So it's kind of a, really the problem is in the full specification of the task at hand. And that's why I say, if you're doing this in production, find out what, what use cases are slow. Chances are they're going to be high value, right? Lots of traffic which is going to come from an automated application where you can go and talk to the application developer and say, why is this thing, you know, what, is your, what, are, what, are, the, what are the types of semantic guarantees you want to have upheld? And then you, as a systems implementer or an infrastructure architect, can essentially say, ah, I know how to make this faster. You say you want unique IDs. Well, you've been assigning them, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Instead, if we just kind of partition the ID space using some ideas from this ICT work, oh, we can do much, much better, right? And so, the, the, the upside of this, the specification problem is made easier by the fact that the times when you want to apply all the thinking I talked about this talk are probably automated and high value to your organization. Cool. All right. Thanks for all of your time and your questions. It's wonderful to be here.